Grand Rising, everyone. Grand Grand rising. That is our theme for this year. We are rising strong. We are rising in a grand way all year, and we're looking at topics that support this idea of really showing up in the world in a powerful way. Um, but first, a, a, just a couple of seconds about Saturday. We have a wonderful opportunity on Saturday to celebrate service. As many of you know, I received a uh, honorary doctorate from Centers for Spiritual Living, and we'll be <laughs> we'll be celebrating that through ritual and uh, through a wonderful opportunity to uh, experience that with you. The doctorate is given for. Uh, the going over and above the extra mile in service to our international organization, and I'm so proud to be the recipient of that. It's not something they give out easily, and, uh, and I'm really humbled by it. And the other thing that we're going to do on Saturday is that we are going to offer an opportunity for our ministers and practitioners to rededicate themselves to the service that they provide on a local level to this community. We don't give out doctorates here at Centers for Spiritual Living, but we certainly want to honor all of our practitioners and our ministers who are in service in their own ministry locally. So we'll be doing that. My uh, dear, dear soul sister, Dr. Michelle Wadley, will be here. <laughs> she is a lovely soul, and I know I've brought her here before. Uh, my daughter will be here. She'll be joining us for the ceremony as well. And then, um, and then we'll have a lovely lunch afterwards. And then on Sunday morning, Dr. Michelle will be here to give us our, our Sunday morning talk. So it's going to be a really wonderful weekend, and I encourage you to join us. You're going to want to be here. It's going to be pretty special. <sighs> But one thing I won't say about it, it's not going to be perfect. <laughs> It'll be just right. It'll be a wonderful opportunity for us to really celebrate and honor and rise up in with this idea of service. But it won't be perfect. And today we're talking about um, the mo all month it's perfectly imperfect. And today we're talking about leaning into imperfection. And that might feel a little counterintuitive to some of you to lean into imperfection. And I would be remiss if I didn't first mention what happened yesterday in our country. Because I think it was really hard. It was hard for all of us. It's hard if he was your guy. It's hard if he wasn't your guy. And I think there's, a, there's something to be said about the turmoil and the discord that we're experiencing in our culture and in our country. The, the, the politicians and the media are uh, spinning things up and people are getting angry and they're, they're uh, arguing with one another. There's there's discord in the air, and unfortunately, one sad soul thought that the only way they could deal with that is through violence. It's, uh, it's really challenging to be in this place where, um, I don't know, it's almost palatable. There's like this fear, and um, things are getting stirred up in the... the um, the media, I have a friend who's a journalist, and she said you should really refer to it as non-journalistic -jour media because there are still journalists out there that fact check and, and try to do some good reporting so that we can really stay in touch with each other and what's going on in the world. But there's this media spin, this, uh, this thing fighting for attention and trying to you know, make sure everybody's watching, and it creates this discord that, that, for me, feels very palatable. I'm grateful that Donald Trump was not injured badly. Um, I'm sad about the two individuals that lost their life. And I think it, it's a wake-up call for us as religious scientists, as spiritual practitioners, as people who want to be 
conscious as we walk through the world. Well, we have an opportunity to do that. We have tools that teach that. We, teach, we have classes. We um, have principles and practices that will bring us to a place of being conscious as we walk through this, um, this situation in our country. And I think part of the issue, and to kind of weave that into this idea of leaning into imperfection, is that there's a certain seduction with perfection, right? There's a certain draw where we want to get things just right. And yet, I can tell you that the places in my life where I have stumbled, the places in my life where I've made mistakes, are the places where I have grown the most, where I have learned the most, where I've been able to, to become more than I currently am. I can expand, I can, I can lean into that. I had, a, um, had my first job in public accounting. I was pretty new to that. I had never worked in public accounting before and I was, I was, uh, it was a great opportunity. I was a young woman in my mid-30s and um, the first day, I had, and, I, and, I, and I knew, I had done some tax returns, but not many. I was an accountant in that profession. And, and uh, the first day, I sat down in my little cubicle, and one of the assistants came in, and they dropped a box in front of me and walked away. And I went in the bathroom and cried. <laughs> I had no idea to do it with that box. I mean, it looked like they wanted me to do something corporate. <laughs> and I had to get the courage up to, to go in and, and ask for help, to say, I don't really know what to do with this, to lean in to not knowing, to lean into the imperfection of not arriving at a certain place in my career. The woman that I was working for later said to me that, in an encouraging way, she shared that it wasn't our job to know everything. It was our job to know when to ask questions. And that was a life lesson that has carried me through to today. Um, and still my pride can get in the way of, of my imperfections and being willing to ask questions because there is that seduction of imperfection. There is that, that wanting to really do things just right. And I think as we look at this political landscape and the discord that's, that's happening, there's a lot of imperfection in our country right now. And we seem to have this drama triangle going on. If you're not familiar with that model, it's um, the drama triangle is when you have three points of intersection to any situation. You're either a villain, a victim, or a hero. And none, if, if you're playing the victim, if you're playing the villain, if you're playing the hero, none of them are a, approaching a, a situation, a system, a problem from a place of wholeness. Instead, you're just taking one little viewpoint of it. And you're actually, you know, you're looking for someone. If, you know, I, I like to play the hero. Most of us do. <laughs> no one wants to be the victim or the villain. And if you're playing the hero, well, somebody's got to be the victim and the villain in that kind of scenario. And if we are so attached to what we think is perfection and wanting to get back to that, well, then we create all this unhealthy dysfunction with people in our lives, with systems, with the government. Nothing is perfect. I remember, as a young woman, being a little entranced by politics because I saw it as public service. I saw it as an opportunity to really be in service to the people in my community as a politician, and, and, I, and I looked up to that. It, it took a couple of years for me to be a little disillusioned by that, but it is a beautiful idea. And Ernest Holmes has an award-winning, famous radio talk um, entitled Spiritual Armament, Armament, and in it he says this about governing and that ideal. It would be advisable for us to reread the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States and try to think out their meaning all over again, line by line, word by word. 
For here we find not only the supreme ideal in government, but specific and definite directions for working it out. And it is simple enough. A federal union so organized that it may protect the interest of the common good without infringing on the rights of the individual citizen. That idea of protecting the interest of the common good without infringing on the rights of individuals is a value that we can talk about here in spiritual community. It doesn't address a red party or a blue party. It addresses an ideal or a value that we can lean into. And when we're not experiencing that, well, that's what we mean by leaning into the imperfection, the things that aren't working. And I think it's a, a lost art to be able to look at the common good without having a personal agenda. I think we've gotten a little lazy, actually, <laughs> where we've begun to think, you know, care more about our personal issues as opposed to the, the common good. And I think it's hard not to, right? I think it's hard not to do that. It's, it's, it's a, we, we need some tools to be able to work through that. And so I think that when we're experiencing imperfection and discord, it, there is an opportunity for us to lean in. There is an opportunity for us to begin to pull things out of our spiritual toolbox, whether it's this national dysfunction or whether it's something that's happening in your personal life. We can use some of the spiritual tools that we have here in this, in this philosophy. And, and actually, one of the wonderful things about our philosophy is that we draw from lots of different places. So these are going to seem familiar to you. It's not like I'm going to bring out some real, you know, deep, dark, mystery thing that you have to master. We're going to talk about acceptance and forgiveness as tools for leaning into discord, of these tools for leaning into imperfection and finding out what it is that wants to be teased out in us, what, what wants to come forward in us. Now, when I say con accepting something, it's different from acquiescing, and it's different from uh, uh, allowing bad behavior. It's more about seeing something for what it is. Because until we can accept something, we're fighting it. And when we're fighting, we can't think clearly. And so I have this wonderful quote, and it comes from Bill Wilson. Actually, it comes from Dr. Paul, who was a um, recovering alcoholic, and he writes this. And I've changed a couple words so it'll fit every situation. He says, and acceptance is the answer to all my problems today. When I am disturbed, it is because I find some person, place, thing, or situation, some facet of my life unacceptable to me. And I can find no serenity till, until I can accept that person, place, or thing, or situation as being exactly the way it is. At that moment, nothing, absolutely nothing in God's world is by mistake. Until I could accept, and this is where you can fill in the blank, whatever it is that you're, having, you're struggling with, until I could accept blank, I could not be clear. Unless I accept life completely on its own terms, I could not be happy. I need to concentrate not so much on what needs to be changed in the world as what needs to be changed in me and my attitudes. And this is what we teach in this philosophy, that it's an inside job, that it starts, we start with ourselves. We get clear, we get grounded. And then once we get clear, then we know what, to, what, we, what action to take, if any, what is ours to do. Now, I can't change the candidates. I can't change the system. I can't change colleagues that I'm struggling with, working with. <laughs> um, but I can change me. I can change my approach to it. I can recognize whatever it is that's in front of me that has presented itself for me to move through. And once I've accepted where I am, 
then I can lean into forgiveness. And the tricky part about forgiveness is we think it's about somebody else, but it's all about us as well. Then the Course in Miracles, which I think is like the supreme doctrine of forgiveness. The whole Course is about forgiveness. <clears throat> it says this about forgiveness. First, it starts up by reminding us we are not human beings seeking a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings who think we are having a human experience. <laughs> Right? We are spiritual beings who think we're having a human experience. We forget, right? So the Course is reminding us who we are. And then it goes on to say, and the world then takes on the appearance that, ref that reflects this mistaken identity that we have assumed. So we are spiritual beings thinking we're having a human experience and suddenly we project out onto the world that human experience, that mistaken identity out into the world that we see around us. The Course goes on to say, forgiveness is aimed at transforming my perception of everything I see. Forgiveness is aimed at transforming my perception of everything I see. So therefore, if I can find a place of acceptance, again, not acquiescence, not allowing, not um, continuing on with the situation, but at least accepting what is, what is in front of me right now? What am I disturbed about? And then to look at the places within me that I need to forgive my perception, the, the way I'm looking at it. I'm, I've been having a challenge with a colleague um, not somebody in this community, as you know, I work in, I'm in leadership in our international community. And for me, every time I lack the ability to accept this person exactly as they are, well, I, I struggle because I want them to be somebody else. When well, that's ridiculous. You know, we have different approaches to things. And so my ability to accept that person for who they are gives me permission to accept me for who I am. So then, therefore, I'm instead of dealing in this waffly place of wanting somebody to be somebody they're not, I can be really clear about who I am. It works both ways. It's a it's a outward inward thing. And then when I can forgive myself for having that perception, for wanting to change somebody who is perfect exactly the way they are, and I can lean into my imperfection of not accepting them and wanting things to be different. When I can do that, something comes over me that is completely different. It's a, it's a grounding, if you will. It's a, it's a clarity that allows me to not only know who I am and what it is that I need to uh, stand in or work towards, but I can hear the other person too because I've stopped trying to make them somebody else. And then there's some content that is there for me. There's some, some exchange that I can have with them. And so with these, these um, practices of acceptance and forgiveness can bring us to a place where we have some level-headedness some clarity to know what is ours to do. It's so much easier to just want somebody to do something, be something they're not. It's so much easier to, you know, just want it to be my way. But the world is in this place right now. Um, it feels like the world is having a worldwide chemicalization process. Do you know what that is? Do you know chemicalization? Do you know that term? If it's, it's, chemicalization is um, a term that Emma Curtis Hopkins used 100 years ago. And it's that place where we have a new spiritual idea, but we're still steeped in an old pattern. And so the new spiritual idea meets the old belief pattern. And the proverbial as the Irish say, shite hits the fan. <laughs> hits the fan. We have this resistance, and we don't even know where the resistance is coming from until we can accept, until we can. And there's other ways to do this, but this is, what I'm, this is the pathway I'm suggesting this morning of accepting what it is that we're 
we're dealing with, and then to forgive ourselves, when, and forgiveness is also about letting go of attachment, so that we can, be, excuse me, so that we can be clear. And I, I just don't, I think that, I don't know that people are able to do that. They get so attached and, and passionate about things. And I'm all for being passionate about things. But what I know about this, this world that we're living in that seems to want to deal with all the problems and um, try and everybody can fix them and they're not my fault, they're your fault. And I'm going to fix you and I'm going to fix the mess you made. All of that stuff is not getting us anywhere. But if we can come to a place of being grounded, if we can get some clarity, that's when we can, I can... I can see you and you can see me. We can begin to work things out. And then once we get to that place of acceptance and forgiveness, one of the tools I like to use is affirmative prayer. Spiritual mind treatment, or as I like to affectionately refer to it as neuropathway regeneration. (laughs) Where we are able to go to a place of scientific prayer so that we can begin to intentionally change our thinking, to get clear, to get grounded, to begin to respond to life as opposed to react to it. Holmes says this about prayer and acceptance. Prayer is not an act of overcoming God's reluctance, but should be an active acceptance of God's highest willingness. Through prayer, we recognize a spiritual law that has always existed and put ourselves in alignment with it. Emerson described prayer as the study of the unfound infinite. The study of the unfound infinite. Doesn't that sound like full of possibility, full of promise, full of potential? And that's what prayer does. It, in, it invites us to really engage in this thing that we call the creative process, to be part of that, to let go of all the things we're holding on to, get clear, engage prayer, and then we know what, to, what it's ours to do because we've, we're operating from a place of clarity. And if we can use this regularly, it can really help us. There's a couple of other tools that I want to share with you. One is being offered by Centers for Spiritual Living. Um, Reverend Sarah Nichols is doing a workshop on uh, citizenship and values around the election. And so now it's on July 20th, and I know you're going to be here instead, but we're going to give you a a resource for it, and then you can register and watch the recording later. Excuse me. Um, So that's on uh, Saturday, July 20th, so you can watch the recording later because you're going to be here hanging out with us, having fun. And then the other resource that has come up is, and it just came up over the weekend, is one of my colleagues, Reverend David Alexander, is going to be doing something called 100 Days of Mindful Practice, um, My Election Intention. And so it will be 100 days of daily mindful messages from new thought leaders, including moi. There'll be some opportunities for weekly check-ins and some somatic healing practices that you can try. And that will give you some information on how to plug into that. Now, David, David uh, Alexander, if you know him as uh, Dr. David, I should say, is... Um, He's a, a very passionate about social justice issues, but he promises me that this is going to be a nonpartisan practice. So, no, uh, we're not going to talk about politicians. We're not going to talk about parties. We're going to just going to talk about intention. And so, on our website, I'm going to—I actually haven't haven't engaged our webmistress to put this page up yet, but we're going to put pa- we're going to put resources up for you so that you have some tools to work with to stay grounded and intentional in, in, if you will, sort of the eye of the storm, to keep you in the eye of the storm, that place in the center where you're grounded, where you're not being beat up and mashed up by what's going on in the world around you. 
Um, Pam's going to put those two resources that I just mentioned in our weekly emails. If you haven't signed up for them, go to the website and sign up for them. Um, these are ways where we can begin to live from a place of clarity in a very imp imperfect world, to lean in. I mean, it's tempting to stick my head in the sand. Oh, and believe me, I got a solitaire game that <laughs> when I can't take it anymore, I'm, I'm, a, I'm playing my solitaire. <laughs> and that's okay, too. But don't stay there too long. The world needs our hearts and our minds and our consciousness to move through this day. Just like um, Ernest Holmes when he wrote, if you haven't read the full spiritual armament uh, talk, it's beautiful and it's just as relevant today as it, it was in 1950 when he, when he spoke it in his radio talk. Our opportunity really is to begin to be that place of centered, grounded, intentional consciousness in a turbulent sea of spiritual beings who think they're human beings. It's a beautiful opportunity for us to really step up, to have a grand rising, to be part of God's solution, if you will, source's solution in this crazy, messed up, climate that we find ourselves in. I, I, think it, I think it's a great opportunity for each one of us. And I, and I know that for me personally, I can't do it alone. I need you. I need my spiritual community around me. I'm guessing you need some help too. So let's do this together, shall we? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a, a new day and we have an opportunity to, to be a positive force at least in consciousness, at this time. Thank you very much. Mm. So let's go ahead and pray. And if you'll join me, to lower your gaze or close your eyes, and we'll do some of that neuropathway regeneration right now. And so we recognize that one source, it is immutable. It is constant. There is a purity of its essence, this creative spark that is forever experiencing the world by means of each one. And so I know that each one in this divine connection of of uh, creation and expression and opportunity and potential that we open ourselves, we allow ourselves to be used, we align ourselves with this beautiful, absolute, I think Emerson called it, unfound infinite. And we allow it to find itself within us. We ground ourselves in love. We ground ourselves in the power of spirit. Not the worldly power, but the power of spirit that only wants to experience itself by means of us in ways that are uplifting and, and bringing people up and holding ourselves up and taking care of ourselves as well. I know that all of this comes together within our very own hearts and minds and that spirit uses us in delightful and wonderful ways to support each other when we're down, to remind us of who we are when we're confused, to give us the courage to be brave when we need to be brave. In all these ways and so much more, I know that spirit is sourcing each one of us and that our part is simply to be willing, to be willing to look a discordant fact in the face, to forgive ourselves, and to be clear. And so I know the power and the presence of the one that moves through each one of us in its own individuated way 
which is perfectly imperfect. And I give great thanks for knowing that this power is moving through each one of us. It is humbling to simply surrender myself to be used by God, knowing I can use this power and this power can use me. And so it is with a grateful heart that I let this go. I let it be. And together we say, and so it is.